All right. Thanks for Shiza for letting us know the the topic that she requested today is a great one. So let me present that screen and all right. And we will go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay. And I cannot remember if I actually started a REPL yet. I did not, I think. <coughs> Cider Jack in. Seal J and Seal JS this time. So I'll have both, although I will probably not be able to share the, uh, the browser with you, probably. But <coughs> we'll go ahead and go forward. All right, so we're talking about immutable data here. Okay. Then my REPLs just began. This is my CLJ REPL. You can see in the mode lines here, CLJ REPL and pending CLJ, which mood changed because it's still waiting. But I say start in the CLJ one. And then as soon as I connect a browser, which I can actually do on another side here, and I can see that the port is 3000. As soon as I connect a browser, the top one will change. So I'm gonna go browser localhost colon 3000, boom. And there you see the, the REPL just changed. So browser connected, okay, great. That's going to be valuable as we look at the front end database. So, all right. <coughs> okay. So first we're talking about immutable data. Has anybody gathered, what, what does that actually mean, immutable data? And why is it worth talking about enclosure? Immutable data means you can't change it. So like if you edit a map, you're actually making a new map instead of changing the current one. Yeah. Okay, so I've made foo. What what command adds a key to the map enclosure? A sos, a a s s o c. Yeah, a sos. And I, and I've heard it said both. Some people say a sock. Some people say a sos. I like a sock. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've always said a sock, but then you think, well, it stands for associate, so either one works. All right, so you see that I did asosh to foo, another key with another value. And you can see that they're both on there. So you, from, a, from a traditional perspective in programming, you might think, hey, we just changed that thing, right? We just we just pushed a thing onto the array or we added a thing to the map, that's, that's normal. But immutable data means that now if I check what is foo, it's still the original thing I defined it as because it's immutable. And if I wanted to make that change, I need to say that I am going to redefine foo. So I could say something like this. <coughs> and so now I've got the new thing. But unless I do that meticulously, then it's not gonna happen. And that's one of the things that marks how closure deals with state and with immutability and data. So the opposite of immutability is mutation. And mutation is common, especially as a holdover from like the dawn of computing. We're talking Nuremberg machines. And so the early early programming, because you're, and Nuremberg is the wrong word, sorry about that. But the idea was that you have limited space on your machines. And so you want to shuffle things around and use that same space as much as you can. Now, there were a couple problems that carry through. So one thing today is that usually our space isn't nearly as limited. And so immutability is a lot more tenable than it was. And secondly, mutability, mutation is bad for the brain. Like it's really hard to keep things straight as you've got mutation going on. So especially as you're debugging things, you're wondering, oh, to debug properly, I need to have the state 
that whoever was in when they got the bug. And if state is always changing under my feet because of mutation, it can be really hard to debug. Whereas if I'm using immutable data structures and it's pure functions, meaning you, just, you, you hand me the entire state in a thing and I can just load that thing in and now I've got your state, Debugging is so much easier. So immutability has a lot of cool ideas. And if you look into it more, um, some of you might be computationally minded saying, oh, isn't that really bad for performance? Doesn't that really hurt our, our effectiveness as far, you know, if we're trying to make a low level thing, there are some advanced ideas in immutability, so, several of which Clojure uses, especially the main ones. There are actually papers on immutable data structures. And those papers talk about some of the clever tricks they do to make things immutable in a performant way. So if you're still trying to perform on a microprocessor, you might still have some problems, but we're doing web dev. Immutability is awesome because of that debugging thing. So, all right, let's go ahead and continue here. So we've got our immutable data structure and We've got the fact, and, and this is all structures in Clojure are immutable by default. So if I, <coughs> that's gonna fail. Why? Because, oh, I should look at the error manager, sorry. Because a sock doesn't work on a vector, right? So, Instead, we'll say conch. And there are a couple of things that we want to talk about here, like does it go on the front or does it go on the back? And it depends on if you're using a vector or using a list. We don't really care because we almost always use vectors. So, okay. The point is, though, if I do foof, I still have the original thing unchanged unless I specifically make that change. So let's take a look at a problem then. Okay, so let's say... Let's have the problem of gathering all numbers from zero to a hundred dividable by three. Okay, so how can we do this? Now, in the traditional way, so does anybody know, how would you do this in, uh, in an imperative language with mutations? I know some of you program in other languages, so tell me, what's what's a mutation way to do this? You could have a, an array list, for instance, and then iterate over all numbers 0 through 100, and then uh, perform a modulus operation to see if it's divisible by 3 or not. And if so, uh, you take that value and you insert it into the array list and then return the final array list okay I, I like that definition here so let's let's move with this all right thank you scott so here i've got my numbers zero to 100 possible gotchas i can't quite remember if i'm going to have inclusive or exclusive there so i might be a number short but we'll see or a number extra we'll see all right and do seek I'm going to do say that means I'm doing side effects, which basically means probably mutation. It, unlike Haskell, it doesn't mean that I have to use mutation here, but as an indicator, it usually means that's why, you, because do seek is not going to return anything meaningful. So I need to handcraft something is going to be changing. So do seek and numbers. How about we just print them for now? <coughs> I use when. Let's make that a new line so it's a little nicer. When All right, anybody spotting any mistakes there? I think I got it. Let's give it a try. Well, 
fast computer. Great. Okay. So we printed, now you know, at the end of the day, what do we have? We, we have nothing. We, we did a do seek, so we don't have anything, but we, we found them all. Okay. Now, a question, the next question is, and I guess I'll ask Scott to continue his explanation with this one. What if I want those? I want them in a collection. Now what do I do? So do seek doesn't return the uh, the value or is the, anything you're iterating over, it just returns nil. If you want the collection, you can use perhaps like a for loop and then store, you could insert into a vector each um, <coughs> number that matches the criteria and then uh, return that final vector. So you could say insert or into and then space uh, vector and then you have your for loop as a, as a second argument. For the okay, case. so I like that. So you'll note that um, in this case, I could use do seek or for, because I'm constructing a thing, they'll, they'll be similar. The difference is that with do seek, if I do it with the do seek, I've got to have a line in here that says stick it into that atom. If I do it with a for, I can say, well, the for is going to return whatever at the end. So let's take a look at what Scott mentioned. Let's do it with a four. All right. Four n numbers, and I'm going to. Say when <coughs> all right and in this case we're actually not using that vector at all actually because remember like scott mentioned for return it's a map comprehension a list comprehension so what that means is that it takes a collection and it returns a collection that's what list comprehensions do so in this case we're saying for n in numbers when and we have our condition here then just return n that's all and that's going to be the the collection there let's see what we get what's get what's returned here we're not printing so we're not going to get divisible by three blah 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 we're hopefully going to get the matching collection all right looks looks similar to me okay any questions about how what we just did So I think I probably ran a little bit with Scott's example farther than he meant because he was answering my question of how do we do this mutation? And I instinctively just did this without mutation. So sorry about that. Um, so here in this case, we did no mutation. We simply grabbed them all. So maybe we'll force ourselves to use more mutation. Well, that wouldn't force it. Um, very often you don't need mutation actually once you get your head around it. And so I'm having a hard time even think of a example that would kind of require mutation here. Um, but let's think of another way of doing this. Let's do it with the do seek. Okay, so we've got our numbers. And by the way, um, some of you were asking about destructuring recently, and, and this isn't exactly that, but remember how I said destructuring can work all over the place? Like you can work in lets, it can let work in FNs, it can work all over in your fours and so on. It works in your do seek. And kind of along with that, you've got things like when. It works in most of the same places. So I'm, do, I'm doing a list comprehension, whether it's a for or a do seek or some other list comprehension. I can still have a when in here. We're going to change this a little bit. So how about we say, let's take every number divisible by three and the square of that number. All right. Does anybody know what's the command or what's the function to change an atom? Swap. Yeah. Okay. With an exclamation point at the end. <laughs> yeah. And the exclamation point there is, is syntactic candy to remind you this is mutation. So don't do not do it accidentally. Know that you're changing stuff with mutation, which is dangerous. So that's what the exclamation point means. All right, so we're gonna stick the number on there. 
Now that's not exactly what we want, right? So we want to stick which number on here? We'll say, <coughs> let's see. When, grab our thing there. And by the way, you'll notice, does anybody know why I'm using zero question mark instead of like equals zero, blah, blah, blah? So zero question mark, so whenever you're dealing with numbers directly, like equals zero, you're kind of setting yourself up for gotchas and edge cases. For example, maybe I end up with a string zero, or maybe I end up with a float zero and it evaluates differently than a double zero and blah, blah, blah. So functions like zero, question mark, just uh, take that away. We won't have to worry about that. I'm just using the functions here. Okay. All right, so when it's zero, mod three, we're going to add that. To the vector and we said also the square of it right all right so we're going to add a pair to the vector of the number and its square okay so at the end of the day then we can either return the vector or we can just keep the vector. And since we're doing this mutation wise, let's just do that. We're just going to make the change and then look at it. All right. So are we good? Well, for proper mutation, we should actually take our atom out so it has its own context. All right. So here we go, there's our atom, there's our numbers. We're going to go through the numbers and let me space this a little nicer. Okay, I'm actually going to chop that for a second just to get that. And there we go, all right. Numbers range zero to 100, do seek to the numbers and mod and when, when is zero and then we'll swap. And you'll notice here that in certain implementations, if you were to do this some ways, you have to watch out because maybe that loop is going to return nils. And so we might get like nil, nil, three, nil, nil, six. We don't want that. So in this case, when is like not even writing something to the vector unless we get it. So just, just the kind of thing you, you would look out for sometimes. Okay, so that won't be a problem here. Um, am I free? Does this look good, everybody? Anything I'm forgetting? Okay. Oh, one mistake I've just realized. Swap is going to fail us here. Because remember, swap replaces the entire value with another value. That means that at the end of the day, we're going to have like one pair in our vector. It's going to be the last one we got. Because each time it's totally replacing the previous one. So actually, uh, Easton, do you know what we want instead? No. <laughs> update. I guess I might have been able to guess that. Okay. So update should do the trick here. And I believe the syntax is right on that. It's been a while since I've done this. But okay, here we go. Nope. Update is not correct. Yeah, actually, okay, you were correct, Easton. I believe swap is the correct one, and there's another one for the problem I mentioned. Swap does take the function and says, take the existing value and do that function to it and use an org. So, all right. So now let's take a look. If I count my AVEC, and I have to. Okay, so Shizzle, let me ask you this. Why do I need to have an at, an at symbol here? <coughs> I 
You're muted. I don't know if you're trying to answer here. So Shiza, the question was, what's the difference between having an at here or not? I'm sorry. Um, is it like you're setting the value? Not quite. So at is short for another option. So another way to do the exact same thing would be deref. So it takes a mutable thing, in this case an atom, and it dereferences it. Meaning, so in computer science you learn about pointers, and so I've got a, a value that's pointing somewhere, and that's where the value's at. And so technically, I can say, hey, here's my atom, but I've got to do something else to get stuff out of that atom. Is it so, like referencing? Exactly. Yeah, dereferencing de in this case. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the at symbol is syntactic sugar. It's a shortcut for calling deref on the thing. The, the exact same thing. Okay. All right. So I'm going to count. I've got 34 items, which we're going to hope is the number of things dividable, divisible by three between one and a hundred. And let's, uh, well, okay. We'll just go ahead and print those here. And for good measure, I'll say, here's what happens if I don't deref. I've got an atom and it's nice. The, the reader is nice to me because it prints the value of the atom. But um, in an actual program, it's not going to do this. In actual program, I'm going to get a, an atom. It's going to say, hey, you've got an atom. So what do you want to do with it? So normally, I would say dereference that. Now I've got an actual structure. Here are my actual vector of vectors. And there's the, those are the pairs that we talked about. So if I do this again... We're doing mutation here. So I just did it a second time. <clears throat> and I've got twice as many things in it because all I did was add all those things. This is mutation. Okay. So sometimes it's it's handy. So times I've used mutation where it was very useful is when I was scraping, for instance, some database tables that I was converting into another database structure. And they had references to items in other tables. And there were a lot. You know, we're talking like 10,000 or 20,000. So kind of a lot. And I had to go through. And I wanted to keep track of which ones have I seen before. So if it references something I've seen before, but now I have a new ID for that thing, I don't want to have to go through the process of looking up that ID every single time. So if I've seen it before, I know what that ID should be. And so I construct an atom which in that case was a set because it does deduping automatically. And I make the set of results as I go. So there are times mutation is definitely the right answer to a problem. But then there are a lot of other times where it'll get you by accident because you might, you might have things in your program if you're not careful, you know, if you're not paying attention to your exclamation points for swapping things, then you might not realize, whoa, somebody ended up with way too much stuff or, or things, the state just blew up on me. What happened? Because you have something that's just adding to your state uncontrolled, which is what this function could do if we weren't very careful with it. If, and it was a real, a real process. All right. Any, any questions so far? <coughs> okay. So there's immutability real quick. And now there are, there are two other um, object types in enclosure that offer different types of mutability. And so they're, they're modeled after what you might think of as a database transaction model. And so they, they have a model where you've got transactions, you open the transaction, you can make changes to the state, and you close the transaction. It's, it's a pretty good idea. In practice, I've never, you know, in all the years I've been doing closure, I've actually never used any of them except Adam. Adam is the only one I've done anything with. And because it is by far the easiest. Now we use in our in our projects we use reframe, which in turn is built on Regent, which is using React JS. Now the way that these use their magic while building on React JS is they keep track of their own kind of atom. Now atoms allow you just to enclose your code to add a, a watcher so that you can tell when an atom changes, when it gets mutated. And the ability to do that is what made Regent originally so powerful as a React um, 
a thing because you're watching the item and you're able to make changes to your state or redraw certain parts of your DOM tree when you when the thing you're watching changes. Now, those of you like Sejong or Ezres might be thinking, hey, that's that's what React does already. Like, so well, React got it from Clojure actually. They, they saw how well Clojure did it and they thought we, we need that idea. It just makes too much sense not to have. So React actually got that from Clojure or Clojure script, I should say. Okay, so let's. Uh, here we are in the back end. Let's go to the front end database here. Now, what you can't see is that I am now going to go around in my browser somewhere. Um, okay, I don't know how to sign in because I haven't ever made an account here because you people have been doing great work and don't need me to do that. So I don't have that much, but I think I still have some state. So the question is, how do we look at the state without So this command is the answer for reframe. Now, we haven't talked a lot about reframe yet. So I hope that you read the excellent documentation they have online. The, we talked a little bit about it in one of our previous meetings, where we talked about how it has a pub sub model. And basically, think of the things that we just looked at for immutable data. The way these data structures work in Reagent and in reframe in general. So people use Reagent for a while. And there were all kinds of ideas sprouting. Well, maybe I want an atom for every page people visit. Maybe I want atom, one atom that has everything in it from everywhere. And there were some, there was some messes that were created. And reframe was made to address that. It said, okay, we've done enough of this of state going all over the place and state being crazy. So reframe offers a principled way of managing state. So we're going to model it in such a way with events and subscriptions. And we're going to have dispatches and so on. And this is how we're going to stay in touch with everybody who's doing things to state. Now, reframe is excellent. So region without reframe, I use that for years. And it's OK for small applications. So if you're making a tiny little web app and you don't have much state. So for example, I did this on my web page, toryanderson.com. You have, I just, Adam, I'm not, I'm not bothering with reframe. I'm just sticking things in atoms because I've got like a total of six pages and I don't do anything really. There's nothing very stateful. And so that's fine. And that's fast. Now, reframe is great for mid and possibly the lower end of large size applications because it lets you keep track of a lot more state a lot more effectively. And finally, when you're moving past that, there are solutions like Fulcrow, which are for, we're talking at that point, maybe you're thinking about things closer to Twitter or Facebook inside. We're talking big applications. You might want something a little tougher than those. But for anything we're dealing with, reframe is perfect. All right. So I showed you the immutability. There's an atom at the heart of reframe. And all of the magic it does is pertaining to this one atom where it's keeping all of its state. And you can find that atom at the place I'm showing you here. You notice this is not a function call. This is just a plain old value. Okay, we got a lot of stuff here and I got my helper helping me there. Okay, all right. So first thing to notice is it's an atom in that it's a regent atom. Now remember reframe is based on regent. Look at the documentation. If you haven't looked at reagent, it's very cool. The documentation has a cool web page that's interactive and walks you through some things. But the way that reframe decided to do things is it sticks it all in one global atom. Meaning that if I'm, and the reason that's good is because you don't lose anything. So versus having an atom per page, there's nothing an atom per page can do that a global atom can't do. And meanwhile, if I ever need to say, hey, I've got to keep track of that thing they did on that other page, then that's what this is for. All right. And this atom has a lot of stuff in it. Now, you notice I didn't dereference it. So there's this, this cruft at the beginning here. But still, this is enough to say, OK, what's what have I got so far? And I can say, oh, okay. Well, apparently, you can even though I haven't shared my browser, 
you can tell which page I'm on, which view, because here we go. I'm on PsyOps. And the view I'm doing is the magic link render. And read it happens to allow controllers and blah, 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 lots of other stuff. All right. So maybe I want to investigate this a little bit more. This is another beauty of using REPL and also Atoms, I guess. So first off, we can say, I'm going to grab it so I can refer to it easily. And I'm using the at symbol, so I've got an actual thing, not an atom here. OK. Here are all the different top level keys in this state database. And keep in mind that this is all stuff we've created. None of this is special to re, uh, Reframe or Reagent or any of these. These are all things that we've created. This is our database, our front-end database. So there's actual way you can view this through your browsers and inspector tools, similarly, a similar way. And so the documentation I showed the other day has the links on how to do that. I've never actually done that, but you can if you want to just look at it in JavaScript. But here we go in the closure script. And so seeing that, I can now say, OK, um, Okay, so there was a key there that apparently has nothing in it yet. Um, people who've been working on this, will any of these keys have anything in them yet? This is an actual question. I, I don't know. Some of I'm the done. current page uh, keys might have default values in them. There we go. Yeah, so this is data populated by our router and so on. Now, as I make changes, and oh, let's see, can I possibly share my screen somehow? Let me see. No, not easily. OK. All right. So I'm going to start typing into the field, the login field, in my browser. I just typed a thing into it. And let's see, where might I find that? Because as you type, it's adding things to the database to keep track of the state. So I think, Easton, you might be the one who most recently worked on this. I just typed a thing into the sign up or login pit thing. Where did that go? Um, you're right. I definitely have worked on this recently. I don't know. <laughs> OK, does anybody know while I read the, the keys here? Let's see where that would have gone. It's probably just register or something. <laughs> the email address itself that you typed in is probably under the keyword email. <clears throat> I haven't sent it yet. If so you, probably... if you, when you send it, it'll be current user info. That's the one I've been using is current user info. Okay. So let's actually look at the code. This is a good example here. So on the sign up page, which apparently is not in sign up. So if you... Is it register? Use registration. Is this the one? Yeah, I think so. No, it's not finding the, the the word I'm seeing. Is please sign up or log in. So let me search for that. Hello. Uh. There we go. Okay, we are on Magic Link. All right. Uh. So this is the login I was seeing here. Here's the prompt. Here's the form on submit, subscribe. Oh, that's on submit, though. So the input is, hmm, it's going to be using the RFC dispatch set email. 
So RFC is the alias we've set up for reframe, reframe core. And as you recall, there are two main functions you use the most, dispatch and um, subscribe. So we keep track of those in our files. So I'm going to keep track of that one there. And let's go to events. So this is this is a maybe it's a, why is it dispatch and events? Well, this is what it is. We didn't invent this, but we got it from somebody. So we have our events here. I'm going to look for that one. Set email. There we go. And it says I saw in the email the changes we're making. So that's oh, hang on. Did I type the wrong thing here in in the Revel? Probably because because Scott was right. I said email the DB. Well, wh where's my error? Where's my mistake? Anybody catch this? How come I checked it and it's nil, even though I typed in the browser? Um, it's because you defined the atom, so it didn't change. Yeah, I've got a snapshot of DB, and it's before we made changes. So... And once again, this is keep track of your state, right? So there we go. That's what I've typed in. And you can see it in the live database because it's changing the front end database as I go. All right. And in turn, now, one of the common problems in apps with reframing, maybe you've been able to sidestep this in um, our apps here because they've been written before you got here somewhat. But it's common to say, as I type things in, nothing changes on the screen. Like, it, it, I start typing, and it's not happening. And if you were to watch the database when you have that problem, you'll see the database continually has the last thing you typed. It doesn't have the whole string. And so let's take a look again at what's going on here. Let's go to our login magic link here. OK. So the important thing here is that the value so this this lines up with the dom value of the field so whenever you're doing data binding whether you're using reframe or whether you're using react or strip javascript with or angular if you have data binding then once you've bound it you've got to make changes to the thing you bound so rfc subscribe email has to match up with where we're doing a set email so those are the names we've given them. So they're not actually the places, but they're talking about the same place. So I've got a subscription here that says, hey, whenever there's a change, according to subscription to email, whatever we said that subscription means, whenever that changes, that change needs to be shown in my value. That The value is going to change. Likewise, whenever I type a change, change that value in the database. So you see how there's two ways going on here. And this is especially for, um, hopefully to answer your question, Shiza. So we're changing the value in the database here on change. So with every change, every type of a key, it's going to grab that value, stick it in the database. And then the value itself that's shown to you in the browser is subscribed to that. So it sees that change and makes it on the screen. And if everything's working smoothly, that's immediately. There's no lag. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, then. So we've talked about a bunch of things so far. We've talked about immutable data. We've looked a little bit more at the pub sub model. Um, so, and so far, especially from Esdras or Sejong or anybody else, questions and anything that you're wondering about or wondering how to do. I guess my question is just, I mean, I understand, I know somewhat the answer to like, the question I want to say is like, when do you use atoms versus when do you not? Um, but I think more of my question is like, uh, do we like try to not use atoms since we're trying to use immutable data types and make it like easier to debug? That, that I, I'm glad you asked that. So the answer is that you're correct in your intuition here that we try to Avoid so basically the answer to when to use atoms is when you have to, when it would be really cumbersome 
to make a solution without them. And that, that's atoms in general, including reframe. So when should we stick it in the reframe database when, when you have to? When should I use actual atoms instead of reframe? That's another good question here. That might be part of what you're asking. And so the answer to that is you can, you can use your own atom when it doesn't need to be shared. Like it's very local. When you're, you're building state, for example, we had our, our toy example a second ago where we were building a bunch of numbers. Well, more likely you're gonna be building something else, but maybe that thing you're building is only necessary like on one page or in one function. If that's the only place it's ever going to be needed, like it's a very abstract idea that's only applicable there, then yeah, use an atom. And kind of a corollary to that is that make sure you're using the right kind of atom. Because remember there, there are two kinds. There's the kind that you saw me make, which is at the REPL, where I said atom, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a region atom, which we saw in the REPL is represented by our atom right here, see? So this kind of atom is the kind that has been set up by region. So they operate the same, all the same functions work on them. You deref in the same way, but our atoms are connected to the browser with a watcher for their changes. So if you make another atom and changes aren't happening in the browser when you expect them to, even though you're sure you're changing that atom, you might be using the wrong kind of atom. Okay. So let's see your question. Did I did I hit your entire question or do you have more you'd like to add there? Okay. All right. So yeah, when to use the atoms when you have to. So in general, functional solutions are better if you can get away with them. So for example, let's uh, let's talk to the, the functional solution to the uh, come on. I did those in the other raffle, okay. A functional solution to the same problem here. I'm going to do this without any atoms or any state actually. So the only things that happen are what comes out. Normally there'd be what comes in as well, but we're providing that. So, okay. <coughs> Basically is this. All right, so we make our state, we have a list comprehension, and suppose we wanted the entire thing, so. <coughs> All right, that's a functional way of doing it. I used a list comprehension, I used purely immutable data structures, nothing anywhere else was even touched or called or anything, so I didn't mess anything up. So we're totally clean here. So I simply use list comprehension to make a new list and didn't change any state anywhere. And most of the time, so the vast majority of times you can get away with this. And when you do, you're creating a program that's gonna be so much easier to debug and maintain in the future because you'll have to figure out immense, um, I was talking to my wife earlier about how when you're programming, you're, you're running the program in your mind. You don't have to do very much here. It's, it's a lot easier to do that process of running the logic of whatever the computation is if it's all immutable. You don't have to remember some variable someplace, which sadly, actually, like, even doing math, you got to do more than that because like math, you've got variables galore. So it's very nice to have scope here that makes programming easier than math. So, all right. Great question, Easton. Any others as far as state or reframe? Esdras or Sejong, do, do either of you have questions related to um, why video? Um, so in our case, we don't use that because our front end is in React, right? So we're not connecting. Yeah. Connecting with Clojure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you're using straight up JavaScript React, which, so by the way, so in JavaScript, the concepts of immutable data, it, it's a very valuable concept. And so some people use immutable.js. It's a whole library that all it does is give you immutable data because of the advantage we already talked about. And so a lot of people say, hey, let's just use, 
Use Clojure Script as a library. You don't even have to consider like using the language. Just as a library, you get immutable data and whatever else too. So that's an option there. We're thinking about, although in your case, we have thought about that already. We've talked about it. And there's there's a lot going on that it's not necessarily worth changing right now. But that's, a, that's still a way to think about this is Clojure Script is often thought of as just a library, just a JavaScript library.